one, let us right into the throne room. Man, how many could feel the anointing falling? Say amen. amen. Praise you, Lord. Praise you, Lord. Well, just in the way of announcements, uh, uh, normal week this week, about ready to pick up steam, though. Uh, uh, I'll be uh, I'm not speaking this week, right? Matt Cosimina is going to be speaking this Sunday. And then the Sunday after that, I forgot we have a guest speaker coming, a very, very special guest speaker, special to me. Some of you have heard me tell the stories of when I was at Calvary Church of the Coastlands as a young preacher, and I was learning, and I was being discipled. My pastor na pastor's name was Wilbur Wacker, and his daughter, who was in charge of children's, who used to have me uh, 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 do a uh, children's uh, camp, uh, was named Crystal. Anyway, she and her husband Dave will be here in town, and Crystal Wacker, uh, uh, Pastor Wacker's daughter, will be here, and she will be speaking to you. She has been. She has spent the last forty years of her life ministering to children. She has a real passion for children, uh, and, and she's going to be sharing with you uh, her burden for ministering to kids. Uh, and also, she may be getting off of her chest a whole lot of junk uh, that she's been holding against me all, all these years. So we'll kind of see where Crystal goes with the whole thing. But anyway, she's going to be here uh, in, in two weeks. So we got a lot of stuff to look forward to. Next month, October 14th, we're going to have uh, uh, Couples Fellowship. And so if you're a couple or if you're a cup, please come and be here for that. We're talking about how to make your marriage stronger. And actually, the chief benefit is not so much the aim of Couples Fellowship to make your marriage better. That's a side benefit. The primary thing we're trying to do is make your marriage pleasing to the Lord. Your marriage, something that glorifies God. And that's what we're talking about. And so we invite you, if you're a couple or a cup, half of a couple, to come here for that. Any questions? Okay. Um, anything else I'm supposed to announce, Kaleo? Happy birthday to you right tomorrow. Happy birthday to Senor Cosma. Any, anything else? Pray for Puerto Rico. We did that before uh, the service. Anything else? Yes, next Wednesday is Ute Wednesday, so we're going to be hearing from Pastor Kella then. Uh, actually, they usually, well, they usually have uh, either Panda or Pizza, no, Matt's Pizza. They're Panda. Pizza, pizza Panda. Huh? Ah, you hear from me enough. Good Lord, I must bore you to death by now. Anyway, let's pray and let's ask God to share with us this, this evening what he has for us. Father, in the name of Jesus, we come before you. We were talking about the rapture on Sunday, and we ask that you would enlighten us. We ask that you would illuminate our minds and our hearts, that you would give us a fresh perspective and a, and a, and a fresh anointing of faith when it comes to our understanding of heaven and what you have in store for us. So we ask you to open our minds and open our hearts to all of that. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Everybody said amen. amen. Okay, so we're going to talk about heaven a little bit. I want you to turn with me to open. I want you to turn with me to Luke chapter 16. In Luke chapter 16, we find the story of Lazarus and the rich man. And this story is important because it is one of those rare occasions in which we get a window in on the afterlife. Uh, uh, the reason that the leadership of the Jewish faith in the days of Jesus was split, right? The, the governing body was called the Sanhedrin, kind of like saying Congress, the ruling body was the Sanhedrin, but the Sanhedrin was comprised of two different kinds of believers, kind of like two different parties. One were the Sadducees, and one were the Pharisees. Now, the Sadducees and the Pharisees did not see eye to eye because the Pharisees believed in life after death. This they gleaned from the Old Testament, from Mishnah, from Haggadah, from all the writings, the sacred writings uh, uh, of the Jews. They believed that they could discern that their God was revealing through his prophets that there was an afterlife, that after you died, there's something that comes afterwards. Sadducees, on the other hand, 
believe that once a man died, that was it. There's no more thought. There's no more activity. There's nothing else that happens. He goes down. His soul ends. And, and life basically terminates. You have eternal peace. Uh, you don't have any more strife. You don't have any more worries. It's, it's kind of like you're a light bulb and the switch goes off and the bulb goes out and that's it. And because there was enough in the Old Testament to substantiate either uh, 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 mentality, the leadership of Israel was split two ways, Sadducees and Pharisees. And that's who Jesus winds up dealing with, which is why, by the way, just as an aside, most of the friends in leadership that Jesus had were Pharisees. In fact, there's not a single Sadducee that really makes friends with Jesus and he winds up talking to. Talking to. Some, of the, some of the friends in the Pharisaic region that he, 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 he winds up having a relationship with is Nicodemus, of course, right? In John chapter 3, uh, for God so loved the world, he gave his only begotten son that whomsoever would believe on him would not perish but have everlasting life. This is not preached to a whole crowd, Kaleo. This was a snippet of a conversation Jesus was having alone with Nicodemus. Thou must be born again. This is not something that he was preaching up on a mountainside to a whole crowd. This is something that he was just saying to Nicodemus, who wound up taking the body of Jesus after he died on the cross. Joseph of Arimathea, he was a Pharisee. Uh, Saul of Tarsus was a Pharisee converted to being the Apostle Paul. So the ones that believed there was an afterlife they kind of uh, uh, saw more credence in what Jesus was saying. But to backtrack, this is the reason that you don't have a whole lot of agreement and a whole lot of solid perspective in the Old Testament when it comes to what the afterlife would be. So it falls to Jesus and it falls to Paul to really give us illumination regarding the afterlife. So this that Jesus talks about here to his apostles is noteworthy. This is, a, this is huge because it was one of the biggest and brightest windows on what happens to us after this current life is over. Luke chapter 16, starting with verse 19, there was a rich man who was dressed in purple and fine linen, lived in luxury every day. At his gate was laid a beggar named Lazarus, covered with sores and longing to eat what fell from the rich man's table. Even the dogs came and licked his sores. The time came when the beggar died and the angels carried him to Abraham's side. King James says Abraham's bosom. The rich man also died and was buried. And in hell, where he was in torment, he looked up and saw Abraham far away was let with Lazarus by his side. Okay, stop. So, it says that when Lazarus died, he was a righteous man, as you are righteous in Christ, amen? Because you believe in Jesus, your sins are washed. Because you believe he died and arose again, your sins are forgiven, and you are on your way to heaven. If you confess with your mouth, Jesus is Lord, let me hear it. And believe that God raised him from the dead. Turn to your neighbor and tell him, I believe. I believe. You are saved. That's what it says. You are saved. So this future will be yours. The future of the righteous. In this case, the angels, agelos is what we translate as angels. It just means messenger. Uh, come and they collect Abraham and take him uh, Lazarus, excuse me, thank you. They take him to the bosom of Abraham. So, have you ever stopped to wonder, what's the him that they took? They came to get Lazarus, and they took him to the side of Abraham, or Abraham's bosom. What's the him? There is something about the persona, the personality, the person who is and was Lazarus that is taken into the bosom of Abraham. Further, the rich man, he was taken to hell and he, the rich man, was in torment. And we can see from the dialogue and the story that ensues 
that Lazarus recognizes Abraham, Lazarus recognizes the rich man, has discourse and conversation with them. Meanwhile, the rich man who is in hell feels the torment, is aware of what is going on, not only has conversation with Lazarus and conversation with Abraham, but also remembers his brother and has brothers and has full memory, full cognitive memory of not only his past life, but also who's, who's on earth. So when it talks about the angels, the agelos, came and got him, Lazarus, and took him to the side or the bosom of Abraham, and I don't know what, it doesn't say who, who collected the rich man, but uh, it's, it's, it's logical to assume since angels got one, what would come and get the other? But he, the rich man, fully aware and fully cognizant, is in hell. So what's the he? What is the he, and can we find anything in Scripture that helps us understand specifically what is happening here? I want you to turn with me, as we do a very short Bible study, to 1 Corinthians chapter 15. Because 1 Corinthians chapter 15, again, this is Paul talking, and he, he is giving us a little bit of a snippet into what is happening and what can happen. Let's start with verse 35. And I'm reading out of a modern English version. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, starting with verse 35. But someone will say, how are the dead raised up? Good question. That's exactly what we're talking about here. What's the he that the angels took to the bosom of Abraham? What's the he that wound up going to hell? What happens when the dead are raised up? After you die, what happens? One minute after you're dead, what happens? What are you going to experience? What are you going to look, what are you going to look like? What are you going to feel like? What are you going to think like? What's going to happen? Someone will say, how are the dead raised up? What body uh, do they, uh, with what body do they come? You fool, what you sow is not made alive unless it dies. The body shall uh, be but a bare kernel, perhaps of wheat or some other grain. So here, Paul is trying to explain to people who are trying to figure out, what am I going to look like? What am I going to feel like? What kind of body will I have? He's trying to explain, look, you are like a, a, a seed, like wheat. You take this wheat and you put it in the ground and you water it. What pops out looks nothing like that seed. In fact, what pops out of that kernel, whether it's a kernel of corn, whether it's a kernel of wheat, whether it's an acorn, whatever kind of seed it is, the seed is just small and dark and round. It goes in the ground and some metamorphosis takes place, and suddenly what comes out of the ground looks nothing like the seed. You keep thinking it's going to be something like the seed, like you can tell what the plant is going to look like by looking at the seed, and you can't. A mustard seed, uh, 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 an Israeli mustard seed, looks like a tiny piece of black sand. It's barely bigger than that. But you sow it into the ground and it becomes this huge tree that looks like an oak and it smells terrible uh, uh, because, you know, you, you got this, this, this sludge running through its bark and, 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 and through its, its uh, uh, resin. But the plain fact of it is, the point Paul is trying to make is stop trying to think of what goes into the ground as what comes up. And when people think about heaven and when people think about what it's going to be like, Adel, it's just like that. You're, when you envision being in heaven and you hear things like, I'm not going to be married anymore. I wonder if I'm going to be male or female anymore. I wonder how old I'm going to look. Will I still be Puerto Rican? Will I still be Chinese? Will I still look like this? Will I still, you know, will I still be this tall? Will I still be this short? Will I still be this fat? Will I still be this slender? Uh, uh, and, and, and they think like that. To that kind of mentality, Paul would say, stop thinking like this. The body that you are going to have is not going to be like anything 
you are used to. And to the point, one of the reasons why we're bringing this up is when the rapture takes place, when the catching away takes place, a couple of things happen. We studied this on, on uh, uh, Sunday morning, right? The Lord will, himself will come down. You're going to hear three things. Can anybody remember the three things you're going to hear on the day of the catching away? Number one is what? The shout of the Lord. The Lord himself is going to shout. Number two is what? What? The angels, the voices of the angels. And number three is going to be the trumpet sound, the blasting of the shofar, right? So... You're going to hear three different things, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. So you're going to see graves open up, and boom, you're going to see suddenly glorified forms coming out. And then you and I who are still alive, first thing that happens is you're going to be changed in the twinkling of an eye. And after you're changed, you're going to be caught up with those saints that have just come back alive to meet the Lord in the air. And everybody has this extremely parochial view of, you know, I'm going to be married again, I'm going to see my wife again, I'm going to see my husband again, I'm going to see this again, I'm going to see that again. And all their hopes and all their dreams are all based on carnal understanding of what life down here was like. And Paul is trying to say it's going to be nothing like that. So let's go on. Uh, uh, verse 38, then God gives it a body as he pleases and to each seed its own body. All flesh is not the same. So we're talking about flesh here. Now remember, the context of this passage is we're talking about what you're going to be like, Tony, when you're in heaven. You're talking about what you're going to be like when the catching of the way comes and that changing. You're going to be changed in the twinkling of an eye. Changed to what? This is what we're discussing. What will happen to you a minute after you're dead? What will happen to you when that catching away takes place? First of all, it says all flesh is not the same. So he introduces a thought here. He is talking about you are going to be flesh. Flesh. The Greek word is sarx. And sarx just has to do with... Wow. What's the best way of putting it? Sarx is... How did I put it here? Okay, Sarx. It's usually just translated flesh for a reason. Because actually in the Greek, the root compound is actually a little bit complex. It has to do with the way the body, whatever kind of body it is that we're talking about, sees and interprets. Although you can use the word flesh, okay, think of the human body Think of yourself as a computer. Okay, Matt, you're a computer. All right? Uh, 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 yeah. Uh, well, for instance, in, in, in a computer, you have a CPU that's a processor. That's where all the data is processed, correct? And you also have, but, but what do I look at? When I'm sitting in front of the computer, what do I see? I see a screen. And on the screen, I see visual representations, correct? And how do I manipulate what I see on the screen? One of two ways, primarily. Number one is with a keyboard, and number two is with a mouse or a trackpad. Follow me so far? Okay, the SARX is the interface. Your soul and your spirit are the CPU, but the SARX is the interface. So think of it as an interface. I'm getting really modern here and progressive in my, in my theological application. But think of it, think of the flesh as the interface. You cannot see my thoughts. You cannot see my emotions. 
Now, there are real thoughts. There are real feelings. There's real drive. There's a real Wendell Choi under what you see. There's a real Heidi Irvin under what you see. There's a real Richard Bowles under what you see. And what you see here may or may not be what is truly there. Follow me so far. Okay, most of you see him, but you don't realize what God sees. This is a warrior. Pure, shining white, powerful, terrifying to the enemy. If you were to see Richard Bowles the way Satan sees him, you would understand why he gets attacked so much. Because in the spirit world, this guy is dangerous. He's deadly. He could cause so much destruction to the satanic world, it is not funny. By simply uttering the name and beginning to pray. How many know what I'm talking about? Say amen. But you can't see that here. What you're seeing with this face, what you're hearing with this voice, what you're, what's, what's being communicated to you with the words that he says is kind of like what you see in a computer screen and the click clack of the keyboard and the movement of the mouse. The SARX is just the interface. But it's what you see and it's what you interact with. But as it goes on to say, there's two kinds. All flesh is not the same. And it goes on to talk about different kinds of sarks. There's a kind of sarks, flesh, interface of men, another beast, another fish, another birds. So yeah, I get it. You know, Paul seems to be going sideways here a little bit. Yeah, I get it. Fish meat is kind of one way. Chicken meat is another way. Uh, these incredibly hard noodles that we were eating tonight uh, has flesh of another kind, okay? And then male, male uh, uh, human flesh uh, is, is, is something else. So he's talking about real flesh, real interface, real sarks, but different kinds of animals are different. So everybody's reading this going and, and reading the letter in Corinth going, uh-huh, yeah, I kind of follow that, sure. Mouse meat is one way, fish meat is one way, monkey meat is one way, I'm one way. But then he goes to say this. There are also celestial, that is, bodies that are designed for heaven and their terrestrial bodies that are designed for earth. And the glory of one is one way and the glory of another is another. There is one glory of the sun, another glory of the moon, a glory of the stars, one star differs from another star in glory. So also is the resurrection of the dead. Whoa. So now you're talking about, first he was talking about different forms and different flesh, right? Fish one way, animals one way, people one way. Now he's talking about people in heaven and people on earth being different. Different kind of flesh, but still flesh. Now what do we gather from this so far? This means that right now here on earth, you feel your arm, there's flesh there, right? The promise of scripture is when you get in heaven, there's also going to be flesh. So what do you say, Richard, when somebody says when you're in heaven, you're just going to be this bl protoplastic blob of light. You're going to be this spirit cloud thing that's just going to kind of emanate. And you're going to kind of float through space and you're just going to kind of be. Wrong, right? Why? How do we know it's wrong? Because this is what scripture says. There is a kind of flesh. You're going to have a body. You're going to be in something. Well, my question is, since you die and the body is on earth, Lazarus dies and the body's on earth, it is buried in the potter's field under the ground about two feet deep, and there's all kinds of vermin, you know, eating at the meat because it's all rotting away. What kind of flesh does he have? What kind of arm does he have? What kind of flesh does he have? If the body that he was previously in is rotting in the ground, what's he in now? And who's the he that remembers his brothers? Who's the he that is able to communicate? Who and what is the he that interfaces? Now it says there's different kinds of bodies. Ooh, cool. So let's go on. So also is the resurrection of the dead... The body is sown 
in corruption. It is raised in incorruption. It's sown in dishonor. It's raised in glory. It's sown in weakness. It's raised in power. So think about the body you're in right now. It describes your body as corrupted. It describes your body as weak. It describes your body as ugly. It describes your body as decaying. Falling apart, prone to die. One day, unless the Lord comes back. The plain fact of it is, it doesn't matter how young you are. How, how old are you, son? 14? Boy, to be 14 again, you know what I mean? Anyway, but you're 14 and I'm 59. So there's like, what, 90 years between us? Okay, so I'm way, unless some accident happens, I am way closer to, the, to six feet under than you are. And hopefully that's true, amen? But nonetheless, here's the thing. Eventually, he and I will both be gone. Because we are in these bodies that rot. We are in these bodies that are prone to genetic degeneration. Do you know that the way you look is actually more, geneticists will tell you, the way you look and the way you sound is actually more mistake than reality? I look like this primarily because of genetic damage to the original strain and the original design of the DNA that is contained in my cells. The reason that I am aging, the reason my hair is white, the reason there are wrinkles here, the reason when I golf I can't turn the way I want to turn, I'll turn anymore is because my body is degenerating. I am getting older. My bones are getting brittle. My ligaments don't have all the, the what, what's the word I'm looking for? It's, what? Tofu, what? <laughs> so, fluid? Sonoma fluid? Like the wine from Sonoma? I got a lot of that, believe me. Anyway, but the point is, the body's degenerating. It says so. So that's the kind of body that goes in the ground. But what you, and we're going to figure out in, in a bit what the you is, but what you're going to put, put, put into is going to be incorruptible. It's going to be powerful. It's going to be not even worthy to be compared with the body that you have now. It's going to be a different kind of body. It's going to be a different kind of sarks. It's going to be a different kind of form. You're going to have a different kind of body. And here it is in verse 44, which is really where it all cruxes. It is sown a natural body. It is raised a spiritual body. So we're talking about flesh. We're talking about the interface. We're talking about what you see and what you relate to. Now here, we find in 1 Corinthians 15... Verse 44 and following, we see that there are two kinds of bodies. There is a natural body and a spiritual body. There is a somatikos. And there is a pneumatikos. Or a psychikos. Two different sections is referred to differently. So this is what's sown into the ground. This is a physical body. And what comes out of it is a pneumatikos. Tikos is a suffix. Uh, and tikos kind of, you, you can say, you can roughly translate it to form or function. Soma is the body physical body suke is the physical soul so what goes into the ground is a combination of a physical form and a soul so let's 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 summarize that right here what goes into the ground is a physical body that's what you see now body we'll capitalize that and soul and what's contained in the soul is the mind and the heart and the will the mind is how you think the heart is how you feel the combination of these two 
drives your will and causes you to want things, desire things, and, 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 and want to do certain things. So your mind, your heart, your will, who you are, what you are, what you remember, what you know, what you think, what you feel, what you want, this is all part of the suke, the soul. And the soul right now, according to this, is deposited in a somaticos as a physical body. So the real you, Jose, the real you, the real sukikos, the real soul of who you are, that contains your awareness, that contains your thoughts, that contains your emotions, that form your drive and your will, that make you who and what you are. This is contained in this somaticos, this physical body. And this somaticos is decaying. The Sumaticos is, is weak. This Sumaticos is, by scriptural definition, ugly, unattractive. And it's not meant to be eternal. But what this is saying is this. This is what's going to get sown into the ground. What comes out. What your resurrection self is going to be like. Resurrection, Jose. Post catching away, Jose. You are going to have a sarx. You are going to have a form, but that form is going to be powerful. It's going to be perfect. It's going to be awesome. But here's what you've got to understand. The same sukikos, the same mind, the same heart, the same will that you have now is now going to be put into something else. Now, we call that something, by the way. All you guys that are in computers... You buy a new computer now with brand new CPA and a new case and a new this and a new that. First time you turn it on, what's the first thing the computer asks you? Do you want to migrate data from a former machine? Well, anyway, when you own an Apple, that's what it asks. Okay, I don't know what, what on earth a you know, PC is going to do. Would you like me to kill you? Anyway, um, uh, because that's pretty much what it would do if I had to switch to a PC. Anyway, um, so, but here, here's what it asks. Okay, and those of you that are not computer savvy, this is the wonder of, of comp Apple computers these days. And it's this. So I have this old Junkalunka computer. Look at Ari's computer here. Good Lord. We bought this for her, what was this, 20 years ago? Okay, look at this. This thing has a CD, CD drive in it still. This is how old it is. This thing still has a CD drive. Okay? And it's Junkalunka, and this is, this is what is this? The thing, the thing runs CPM. It has a, a, a 385 processor or something like that. Okay, it's really old, really slow, really junk, really small, not much memory, not much speed, not a very good monitor. So I go down to the Apple store, and I see that the latest uh, laptop they make, a generic laptop by Apple, you know, standard issues, like, what, 15,000 uh, bucks? That's the latest, right? So I buy that for Ari. Don't even think. But I buy that for Ari. It's a brand new computer in a brand new case. And you turn on the screen. Oh, God, it's so bright. I can't believe it. These Apple colors and these Apple resolutions, just amazing. I've never seen anything like that in any PC anyway. Um, it's just beautiful, right? But it doesn't have any of my pictures. It doesn't have all of these words for the sound. It doesn't have all the applications. So is Ari going to have to retype every single song? Is she going to have to copy every single photograph? Is she going to have to take every single email and send it to herself on the new computer? No. She does this thing called migrate, where she ties one to the... Actually, you don't even have to do that anymore with apples. It's all Wi-Fi. And you just say, okay, and you hit this button, and on the brand new computer, bloop, something comes up. Do you want to migrate from another machine? You say yes. And, uh, uh, you know, there, there may be, you know, I, I don't know, 300, 400 gigabytes worth of data on this thing. Uh, and, and because it's an Apple laptop, 17, 17 seconds later, it's all done. Uh, at least the process of saying start. And here's what winds up happening. On the brand new machine that's in a new case with a new screen and a new keyboard, new interface, all those memories are there. All those images are there. 
everything's there, but this is a new machine now. And you look down at yourself and you realize this is a different body. And you look at yourself in the mirror and you realize that is not the same face. And you realize that your physical capabilities are not the same. But beyond that, it's not just the physical changes that take place that are the most astonishing. What happens is your mind changes. Your will changes. Your drives change. Because now you see differently than you did before. How do you see? What do you become? What do you now turn into? Is there anything in Scripture that gives us a definitive hook on what happens? Yes, there is. Turn with me to 1 John 3, 2. This right here, this pneumaticos, this new glorified form, I want to know what the heck I'm going to be like. And I want to know if there's anything in Scripture that tells me what I'm going to be like. As a matter of fact, there is. 1 John chapter 3, starting with verse 2. One of the most astonishing verses in all of Scripture. Dear friends, now, when? Now. now. Turn to your neighbor and tell them, now. now. We are children of God. Think about it for a second. Now we are children of God. Now, because we know Jesus, we are saved. Now, because we know Jesus, our sins are forgiven. Now, because we know Jesus and have faith in him, we will live forever. Now, because we know Jesus and believe in Jesus, when we die, our sarks changes. Now, when we die, we move, our soul, our mind, our heart will be moved from this somatic coast that is thrown into the ground because it's dirty and because it's weak and because it's dying and because it's decaying. We will now, because we know Jesus, believe in Jesus, be moved into this pneumatic coast that is powerful, that is perfect, that is awesome. My question is, what is the suki coast, the spirit body, the body that will be in heaven, the body that I will, be, that I will inherit? What is it going to be like? Is there any way of knowing? It says here, now we are children of God. And what we will be, we will be something, you know. What we will be, do not think for a second, Lillian, that when you die, it's all over. It is not what the Sadducees thought. It is not that you just turn off this light and it's all over. Oblivion, nothingness, darkness, a null existence. No. According to the word of God, you will be something. What will you be? What we will be has not yet been made known, but we know that when Christ appears, or when you die, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. When we die, or when Christ appears, we shall be, everybody say be, like him, for we shall see, everybody say see, him as he is two things change the way you will be and the way you will see the very nature of your existence your physiognomy your appearance will change but this is not as drastic as what changes is the way you see. Two things change. The way you will be and the way you will see. First of all, what will, we be, what will you be like? You will be like him. You will be like him. Now just think in terms of the physiognomy. 
What was Jesus like? What could Jesus do post-resurrection? After the resurrection. Okay, he could walk through walls. What else? He could be anywhere he wanted to be. He could go here. He could go there. He can go from earth to heaven and heaven to earth. He can move between the spirit realm and the physical realm. Right? He does not need to eat. He does not tire. He cannot die or be injured. Does he have physical form? Yes. How do we know that? Because Thomas touches him. But what does Thomas touch? Adel, think about it. What does Thomas touch? Jesus says, feel my what? Wounds. He has wounds here. He has a wound here. He has a wound at his feet. So he has an open wound, Tony, but does it bleed? No. Does it hurt him? No. Does it kill him? No. He is unkillable. He has an open wound simply for the purpose of demonstration that doesn't bleed. He can eat if he wants to, but he does not have to eat. He can rest if he wants to, but he never gets tired. He never gets sick. On the Emmaus Road, he looked in, in glorified physical form. He looked so different. Matthew, they didn't recognize him. They had to wait until he spoke to them, breathed upon them, vanished, and then went, that must have been him because, you know, we felt, you know, our, our hearts on fire and we felt the witness of the Spirit. But there was such a difference to, in the way he looked at first. Mary didn't even recognize him. A woman who walked and talked with him every single day sees the risen Jesus standing in front of her and goes to him and asks him, can you please tell me where they put Jesus? Because we can't find him anywhere. Even Jesus has such a different look about him with this pneumaticos, with the new body, that at first they can't recognize him. He can defy gravity. He can appear in the air. He does not have to walk. He can fly. He can move through different sectors. How many follow me so far? Who's going to be like that? According to the word of God, because you know Jesus and because he is your Lord and Savior, this is what you will be like. As you study the post-resurrection Jesus and you see the things he can do and you see the things that he is like, you can begin to understand what you will be like. What are the two differences? What you will be and what you will how does Jesus see things? Is there evidence and can we see how Jesus thinks, how Jesus feels, and what transformations have taken place in Jesus' mind and his heart that transform his will post-resurrection? Is there any indicator? There are several. How many of you want to know what you're going to think like and what you're going to feel like after you are in heaven? We're going to talk about that week after next. What? It's 8.05. I must be boring you to tears by now. Close your eyes for just a minute. And thank God for all the blessings that you have and will have. Thank Him for who you are and who you will be. The inheritance, the eternal inheritance you have coming. The physical changes, the intellectual changes, the emotional changes, the changes of passion and drive and focus and priority that you will have because you believe that Jesus is Lord and God raised him from the dead and that you are saved, that you are children of God. Just take a minute right now to thank him. And remind him, Lord, please come. Tonight, let this be the night. If not, when these eyes finally close, I thank you, God, for the me that I will be because I'm going to be like you. Thank you, God. In Jesus' name we pray. Everybody said amen.
Thanks for coming. Somebody go save Yuka and Patty, please. And we will talk.